Let's go to the book of Revelation and turn left to Jude. Stuck in there, a little, little slice of bread there in the bigger loaf. Jude 22 and 23. It reads like this. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hate, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. What does this mean? I want to look at two things today, two things that can help us learn something about our own faith. And at first glance, you might think, are you serious? But yes, I am. Atheist or agnostic, question mark. What can we learn from atheism? What can we learn from an atheist? What can we learn from an agnostic? First of all, what, what do many Christians think and feel about atheists? Kind of, ooh, atheists. Kind of, ooh, what is that? What do many Christians think and feel about atheism? Well, there's some stereotypical thoughts out there. I get pictures of the internet debater, the atheist who spends most of his time in the internet debating with a Christian. Round and round they go, blogging and emailing back and forth. I think of a Scrooge at Christmas time, the kind of a miser type, atheist, you know, kind of a grody guy. Sometimes you think of the communist. Let's get on their backs. You know, the communists are atheists. Sometimes we think that. And it's not a favorable stereotype, not really. But then again, there are the quiet, gentle people that basically are minding their own business that are atheists. So there's a wide spectrum of people out there who call themselves atheists in, a, in all kind of areas of life, all kind of professions. Realistically, real atheists don't do the following. So let's make sure we get this straight. They don't oppose God, they don't hate God, they don't curse God, they don't blame God, they don't fear God, and they're not irreverent towards God, not in their own minds. Atheists don't do any of those things. Why? Because an atheist is a person who denies or disbelieves the existence of a supreme being or beings. An atheist cannot be mad at God. There is no God in the, in the mind of an atheist. So what are the benefits? What's the payoff of being an atheist, by the way? It's gotta be some sort of payoff. Well, I'm sure there are many different motivations and many different reasons, and I don't pretend to know them all. But I would say that on some level, some people resist the existence of God because there is a payoff, and it is, some people get attention for it. Some people need attention. And when you stand out as one who is sort of swimming upstream in a world of faith, an atheist gets attention. That's a payoff. Sometimes atheism in the right context, in the context of a family or an organization, it can be a sense of power and retribution against those who do believe. So you have a, you have a voice, you have an identity. You, you don't believe something, therefore you're going to get attention for it, which you want, but you're also going to push back against those who do believe something, and it gives you a voice or an empowerment, a sense of an identity. I remember when I was getting my uh, undergrad degree in psychology, which if you put that with 50 cents, you can get yourself probably close to a cup of coffee. And I remember thinking, you know, homeless people kind of have it good. And I thought, let me take that out for a spin. Let me mentally exercise that one. No bills, no tax returns, no gutters to clean, no snow to shovel. I mean, there's a lot of things you don't have to do when you're homeless. Well, atheism's not different. There's a lot of payoffs. Malingering is the term in psychology. Malingering, what does that mean? It means to fake an illness. People who fake illnesses get attention, they get love, they get affection. They get someone to bring them soup. Well, there's payoffs for different mindsets and ideologies in our culture, and we have to sort of get in the head of those people to sort of understand where they're coming from. And some of them just want to hurt other people because they know it will hurt other people because wounded people tend to wound people. If you've been hurt by someone, you can get back at them by saying you're an atheist. You can adopt something you know that would really upset them. That's part of what it's about. 
Another benefit is an atheist lives without any repercussions for sin. There's nothing going to happen to me. There's, and it's an expression. Um, an atheism can be an expression against a reality of fatherlessness, um, a payback. And it can also, atheism often is the rotten fruit produced by empty legalistic religion. All right, here's a question for you. Who starts out with a faith and leaves it for atheism? Who starts out a Christian and becomes an atheist? I don't know, I struggle with this one. I struggle with this one because the scripture says taste and see. I look at a relationship to God as something that you taste and you see it, and then once you've tasted and seen, there's no way you would take an alternative. You don't put, you don't put a chocolate-covered Oreo in front of me and a tall glass of whole milk and give it to me, and, and, and I look at it and go, ah, no, never mind. Once you taste God, it's not skim milk, it's whole milk. Once you've truly tasted of his love, of his grace, I don't know how you would turn away. I really don't. That doesn't mean people don't. In the last days, it says the love of many will grow cold. Many will abandon the faith. There's a hyper-spiritual thing going on there, and I don't understand all of it, but those who would become atheists who were once Christian, I doubt were ever really followers of Christ to begin with. I don't know how you could walk away from such liberty and grace and freedom and purpose and direction and wisdom and comfort and healing. I don't know how you could walk away from that, but I guess some do. Taste and see, I say to you this morning, and that the Lord is good. So what does God think about atheists? Well, 2 Peter 3 and 9, God is slow to anger. In fact, Exodus 34 is one of the first times God really describes himself. He says, I'm compassionate, slow to anger. God is slow to anger, abounding in love and desiring that none should perish. God loves atheists. That's a given, because God is love. So God loves atheists. Of course he does. Romans 5 and 8, he demonstrated that love by while they were yet sinners, you and I were sinners, he died for us. God loves them so much, he died for atheists. He demonstrated that. He's, that's just a philosophy and a thought, not a feeling. God's not dictated by his feelings. He's dictated by his actions. Faith without works is dead. God died for atheists. And God is grieving. Just like a dove that loses its mate, makes a distinct sound and grieves, grieves, deeply grieves the loss of its mate. God grieves. God's jealous. God hurts. God loves, God hurts, God waits, God's slow to anger, but he's grieving over the atheist. And then in the middle of all of that, Jude says, be merciful to those who doubt. How does one become an atheist after believing or believing, in, uh, believing, or believing in Christ? And as I said, I don't get it, but one way that you, you can stray away from your faith is by sitting in the seat of mockers. I see this happen with young people a lot. They sit in the seat of mockers, people that mock Christianity, comedians that mock Christianity, movies that mock Christianity, video games that mock Christianity. You take a vulnerable young person and you put them hour upon hour upon hour in front of us in a sit them in a seat of mockers and people mock your faith, they begin to adopt that men, the mentality that what it is they thought they believed, maybe they don't believe, maybe what I thought I believe isn't really a belief at all. The redundancy of the technology that is available that brings mockers into our minds time and time again to a vulnerable young person becomes quite effective, actually. Don't find yourself sitting in the wrong seat and make sure your children are not sitting in the wrong seat, the seat of mockers. Do not forsake the assembly as some are in the habit of doing. We're called to spur one another on. When you get picked off from the body of Christ and you got sitting in the seat of mockers and you start sitting in the audience of those who don't believe, you slowly but surely, whether you realize it or not, your faith is being eroded and diluted for the absence of the body of Christ, the koinonia of the fellowship, to spur and encourage and move one another forward, onward in Christ. People lose their faith for a lack of knowledge. And I see a lot of young people today wavering, blaming the church, blaming their parents. My parents aren't perfect, my parents aren't Jesus, so this gives me a reason to get off the hook. The fact is you never tasted and you never saw the depth, the meaning, the intimacy that's available through a personal relationship in Jesus Christ, and you're looking for something else that draws attention to you 
and gives you a purpose and a direction and maybe even helps you retaliate against the very system that sought to embrace you. What is an agnostic? As a person who holds that the existence of the ultimate cause as God and the essential nature of things are unknown and unknowable and, or that human knowledge is limited to experience. Okay. Most of the religions in the world tout a figure that is to be worshipped that is not knowable. Allah is not knowable to the Muslim. I don't know that I could worship someone who's not knowable. Come on. I want to know. I want to know what he's like. I want to know what he's been, I want to know what he said, what he taught, what he did, what he promised. I want a relationship with him so he knows what I think, what I did, what I didn't do, where I'm going, where I've been, and loves me anyway. Agnostic says, you can't know the nature of things that are unknown and unknowable. Demons even get along with this. So to the atheist and to the agnostic, I say this, the demons are one up on you, James 2 and 19. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Demons know there's a God. So we'll leave that where it is. The question is, what can we learn from this philosophy? And you may have some people in your life, some family members, some coworkers, some people that are in your life that you, they're just not there. How do we deal with that? Well, there are some downsides of being an atheist or an agnostic. John 8 and 24, I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Dying in your sins is not cool. Dying in your sins and having no covering for your sins, no forgiveness for your sins, is bleak at best. You're rolling some serious dice with your atheism that in the end, you're going to prove to be right. Oh, but the risk that you are not right with no means of reversing that process there is a dark side to dying in your sins. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, they are corrupt. To live a foolish life is to live an atheistic life. All right, here's a question. Can a Christian act atheistic or agnostically? I just made that word up. Can you and I have atheistic tendencies or thoughts? It's okay, don't be afraid to answer it. Can you or I act atheistic at times? Can we act agnostically at times? And are we secure enough in our faith to honestly answer those questions? Because sometimes the answer, my friend, is yes. And we probably best be sensitive to what that area is, for it's not what we want but it may just be what we have. Let's be honest. Early disciples acted like the atheists at times. John 6 and 66. It's interesting that this is 666. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. There was a lot of tumultuous activity going on. Do you believe, do you not believe? This is all before the cross. Even his brothers, Jesus' brothers didn't believe. They thought it was loopy. Loco! In and out, what's going on here? I don't know if I'm in, I'm out, follow, don't follow. Some are leaving, some are going. Some are uh, prophesying his messiahship and five minutes later they're saying, get behind me, Satan, Matthew 16. I mean, some are betraying, it's all over the map. John 7 and 5, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Yes, believers can act atheistic at times. So before we get on the atheistic bashing bandwagon, let's see if we don't have some tendencies of our own. That's fair. Fair and balanced. Watch out for the Nesses. They're like Loch Nesses. Relativeness. When you open that Bible and you read it in your lazy boy chair, Six in the morning under that light with that cup of coffee right out of your Keurig. Are you totally open to everything that book has to say to you? Are there any areas that maybe are off limits? Have you in your own mind omitted some of those passages or denied the reality in today's world? Have you been taught to highlight some and erase others, that's atheistic thinking. For the, 
Word of God is inspired, all of it. All of it. Relativeness. It's all relative to the situation. This passage doesn't really, not really affect me today. Not really. Okay, there are some of those. Like what you put on your head during a worship service. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking the ones that talk about forgiving other people. Have you boxed something? Do you have a box or a couple boxes where you put things in there and then you vault them shut? Off limits, God. Off limits. Stay away. This is my atheistic box. I will never forgive that person. I would not in a million years go to that person's funeral. I would not help them to my death. I would not help atheistic box vaulted. God, you are not welcome. Yeah, that's pretty atheistic. Self-centeredness. Are there some areas of our life, though it be a sliver of our entire pie of our life, are there some areas of our life where, quite frankly, we are large and in charge? We are our self-imposed Lord of this area of our life. For some people, it's money. Your money is in a box. God, stay away. These are my coins. I'll have coins and no coinania. This is it. You are off limits. I am self-centered and I am the Lord of my domain and this is not yours, God. That's atheistic thinking. I'm trying to say, you know, if we're going to reach some people who don't even believe there's a God, maybe we should acknowledge that we have more in common with them than maybe we realize. Ouch. Sin-drivenness. Sometimes we get entangled in things. I worked for this insurance company one time, and I was walking, working on a Saturday afternoon. I had to go in to do something. I don't know. It had something to do with the commission, I'm sure. And I'm walking to the building, and I look up, and there's this massive spider, humongo spider. It's in this massive web, and it's coming off the gutter of this building. I thought, whoa. So I did one of these. I walked around it deals, opened the door to the uh, to the office, and I go in, and the phone rings. Now, I've answered the phone in this office hundreds of times. Just unthink, I don't even have to think about it. Preferred risk, may I help you? Said it a million times. So as I'm reaching for the phone and I pick it up, I look, and there is a humongo spider on my arm. <laughs> and there is, I now feel it on the, on the nape of my neck, this massive entangled spider web that feels like a cotton field on my head. So I pick up the phone, and without thinking, I... I said, preferred risk, will you help me? <laughs> I was entangled in something. Useless, rendered useless to anyone at that moment. And sometimes we get entangled in certain sins. And the sins that so easily entangle us and enmesh us, and they create this cocoon around us, and in that particular area of your life, God, you are vaulted. You are not welcome. In this area of my life, there is no Lord. I am Lord of this area of my life. That's atheistic thinking. There's no God in this area of my life. Hopelessness. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1 and 27. I don't give a rip what your situation is. It is not outside the reach of the long arm of the grace of God. If you tout any circumstance that in your mind and your unbelief say this is the way it is and it's always going to be, you're not being faithful to the Lord who said, I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these of love, but no, no, no doubt there is hope. There's always hope. For every relationship, for every marriage, for every medical situation, there's always hope. You and I have a mandate from God to believe with hope against all else there's hope. Now, if it doesn't come out the way we wanted it to, doesn't matter. You and I are to be found faithful, believing with hope. You vault your hope and get God out of it. Atheistic thinking. Lovelessness, I don't care what happens, I will never love that person. 
They are the single most annoying human being on the face of the earth. I will never, ever love them. Friend, God is love. You just kicked God out of the entirety of the situation and told him that you're in charge and there is no hope and his promises are null and void and not all his scripture is true. You just called God a liar on some level. Atheistic thinking. Joylessness. If we've allowed ourselves by some way, shape, or form to keep ourselves from experiencing joy and have wrapped ourselves in a recluse of a box where God cannot go and we are destined to be ornery, complaining, whiny people, God is not in that situation. He has been disinvited. He has been denied. In his presence is the fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I bring you great tidings of joy. That's atheistic thinking. Koina nihilessness. You'll not find that anywhere in any book. The aloneness and the absence of a partnership in your life. If your Christian faith exists in some monastic, cloistered environment called your prayer closet, and it's kept for you alone, and you don't interact and share and fellowship and get in the Word and go to Bible studies and worship with other people, if you're a, you're a man on your own island, you have a castaway, a castaway Christianity. That is not God's design. No way, Jose. This thing, I'm gonna go off on my own. I'm gonna have church on my own. You don't understand church. You've just kicked God. You've vaulted your whole entire worship experience to the neglect of God's people that has put there because iron sharpens iron. You can't be sharpened alone. You can't be corrected alone. You can't be encouraged alone. You can't be prayed for alone. That is not God. That's atheistic thinking. Criticalness. Here, I got some words for you. If you're critical of other people, you're booting the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father out of that relationship. I got some words for you. Plank, 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 and plank. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go look in the mirror. You got them in both eyes. Take the plank out of your own eye before you be critical against someone else. And then the last one, restlessness. The atheist has no rest. Rest only exists physically. But there's never a satisfaction. There's never an invigoration, for there's no, no source of it. There's no or, outside energy. There's no outside empowerment. There's no outside anointing. There's no outside investment. You're an island under yourself. You are the Lord of your own life as an atheist. The Christian ought to have rest. When you come to church on Sunday, you ought to be sort of tired and ornery and probably fighting in the car on the way over here. On the way home, though, you're pulling off to make out with your wife, <laughs> holding hands, sharing the love, right? Spending the whole afternoon under that residue of that anointing of the of Sunday morning worship experience. About Tuesday morning, though, whew, things are getting a little rocky. But joy, you know, rest. You got to rest. You come in here. What's my purpose here on Sunday morning? You're going to sit here. I can't believe people actually come out here to, to meet and listen to me on a regular basis. But as long as you're here, what's the purpose? What am I trying to do? I realize that the ministry really is yours. I realize that you have a greater proximity to more people than I could ever have. I realize that you have family members and coworkers and customers in your life that need encouragement and hope and peace and counsel in the, in, in the gospel. I know that. My job is to see if I can get you in here to give you a little bit of rest, give you some Jesus who is the Sabbath, not a day off from work. Jesus is the Sabbath. If I can get Jesus in you by the Holy Spirit, 
I can empower you and send you out to actually do the works of ministry. You're the ones that have customers coming to you from all over the Southeast, not me. I got people coming to me telling me their problems. You're the ones, you're the ministers, the priesthood of all believers. You're the ones in the pregnancy center. You're the ones in the coffee house. You're the ones serving the people in the market. I'm just here trying to see if I can't facilitate, by God's grace, some kind of rest. You're the ones with the kids you're trying to raise. You're the ministers. Restlessness. If you're restless, if you have no rest, if you have no peace, you're anxious and neurotic, you're no good to anybody. That's atheism. For atheists have no rest. They have no Sabbath. And they have no excuse. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, even his eternal power and Godhead, Romans 1 and 20, so that men are without excuse. What have you boxed? Come on now, what have you boxed? What unfinished businesses do you have reconciling with another? What, where did your evangelism ministry go? What box did you lock it in? What limitations have you placed on your ministry in the marketplace? To what extent will you not go? What governor do you have on your outward ministry to other people? What mindset exists in you that says, I'll not go that far, I'll only go this far? What fear line do you have out there that says, I can't go beyond that? I can't exist beyond that line. I can't function beyond that line. I can't be affectionate beyond that line. I can't be sexual beyond that line. I can't, I can't be encouraging beyond that line. I can't be vulnerable, I got a box. Within that box, I'm okay, but outside of that, there is no God. That's atheistic thinking. What can the atheist teach us? That we have boxes, vaults, locked, defined, clearly defined, immovable, measurable but immovable. I'll not do it. I've done it this way my whole life. I'll not do it another way. I'll not go beyond this line. I've drawn it in the sand. Okay. And then I'll come and I'll worship the Lord of heaven and earth who is everywhere, all knowing, all seeing. Yeah, he's everywhere. But he's not beyond that line, is he? No, he's not beyond that line. He's not beyond that line. And I'll not be beyond that line. I thought he was omnipresent. I thought in his presence was the fullness of joy. I thought when you stepped out to reconcile that relationship that's 20 years of bitterness, when you step out and write that note or make that phone call, I thought he was there with you when you did that. I thought you were smack dab in the middle of his will. Mark 9, 9 17 to 24, a man in the crowd answered Jesus. Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. This is horrific. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, he said. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring this boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit, small s, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's the most grotesque thing you've ever seen in your life. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. Paraphrased. He got in this box a long, long time ago. We've been schlepping this box everywhere we go. And he's locked in it so tight, he may never get out. From childhood, he answered. 
It has often thrown him to fire, thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, if you can, question mark, said Jesus. Listen to that. If you can. When you build a box and you keep God out of it, then you go to him to explore the parameters beyond the box, and you say, if you can, it's the if you can that built the box. It's the if you can and the doubt that he can that made the box itself. The very question is the key that locks the box and keeps you from enjoying the liberty and the freedom that God wants for you and I. If you can, said Jesus, Everything is possible for one who believes. Everything is possible for one who believes. Translation, there are no boxes. There are no locks. There are no geographical areas. There are no emotional areas. There are no areas of bitterness or unforgiveness that cannot be touched. There is no cancer cell that can't be touched. There's no doubt that can't be remedied. There is no fear that can't subside. If you can, Jesus said, He was offended. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father explained, exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Interesting. This has really been strong on my heart lately. It really has. There is so much waiting for this church. There are things lined up for this church, set apart and consecrated for this congregation to experience. And the pressure is starting to build on this congregation in the spiritual realm. Pushing, pushing, pushing. Are you going to believe? Are you going to trust? Are you going to let yourself go? And I keep applying that pressure. Pressure, pressure, pressure. And finally, we're gonna to have to make a decision. What do we believe? Are we boxless or boxed? This guy goes to heaven. Get the tour. Checking out every room and every mansion, every abode. Looks at this one room. Door's kind of cracked. Sees this brilliant light coming out. He goes, what's in that room? The angel pushes the door open and the guy steps in. And, oh my word. Floor to ceiling, as far as the eye could see, presents. Beautifully wrapped presents. Comes up to the pile and Looks at one, two, looks up higher, looks to the left, looks to the right. On every present, it's got his name on it. Bob takes his breath away. He looks again. Yes, that's his name. A whole entire room dedicated to presents for this one man, unopened. And he looks at the angel and he says, I, help, please, I don't understand. He said, friend, he said, brother, he said, these are all the things we had set aside for you that you never asked for. This church can ill afford to build a box. Corporately or individually. There is for this church some wrapped gifts, visitation of the presence of God, glory of God, entertaining angels in this place unaware, healing of people's bodies, signs and wonders confirming the word of God, empowerment of the spirit of God, setting free from addiction, hallelujah. That's the thing right now. People becoming aware of their alcohol problems in this church. Pressure, pressure, pressure. 
Who's pushing back? Are we atheistic in our thinking? If you can, if you think I can, <laughs> oh my gosh. If you think Jesus Christ can, if you have some doubts of whether he can, oh my word, where are we? We're the church of Jesus Christ, we're the bride of Christ. With God all things are possible. You and I have a mandate from heaven to believe any and everything it says in that book without question. You have questions, you have a box. And you have the absence of rest. You have a limited hope. Obedience to that word will bring you into freedom you've never experienced before in your life. It'll be a godly church. Biblical church. I want to have a butt kicking church. And until we open those boxes and let God in, I see some butts getting kicked. What's it going to be? Go through the motions? It's winter. It's going to be a rough winter. Numbers are going to be down. Might miss a few services. People will be back in Easter. Grow up. Now's the time to press in. God's not about numbers. Quantity. It's about quality. Press in. Pray. Push back. Open the doors. This altar's open. If you come to the altar, it doesn't mean you have some big problem that someone's going to gossip about. Although there might be one person in this place with the gossip about you. I'll deal with that. This is not a place to, to be identified. This is a place to open the box. Some long lost relationship. The limitation you placed on your ministry the definition you placed on what it means to walk with God. It's bigger and brighter and more life-changing and life-giving than you realized. He says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. That authority has been given to you today. In a spiritual sense, pull that key out, unlock that box. Rest yourself at this altar and ask him to expand your horizons. In Jesus' name, let's worship him in spirit and truth.